Thank you, Linda, and um, good evening. I'm going to move this. It is a true pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you, Linda, and organizers for inviting me. Um, Linda asked me to share actually a completely different story than I typically share. Um, so I thought a lot about tonight and what MITS is all about. So I've decided to share some stories, some letters, some emails, and some videos. You know, when we talk about patient safety, and Patty, Linda, and I have attended probably hundreds of patient safety events, um, there's a lot of talk about ROI and the business case for patient safety. So I'm going to talk about ROI, and I am going to talk about the business case. But in my world, ROI is return on imagination. And George Bernard Shaw said, imagination is the beginning of creation. You imagine what you desire, you will what you imagine, and at last you create what you will. Linda Kenny is a perfect example of this. And her husband shared with me earlier this afternoon that her first meal, I think, attracted maybe 80 some people in her husband's restaurant. And, um, for the first MITS fund fundraiser. And um, her husband shared that her dream became a reality when she, she would dream about MITS laying, and I think it is your Barco lounger with a pillow on your, on your chest. The business case, and I want to talk about business case, and this is a business case for hope. And Dale Carnegie said, the most important things in the world have been accomplished by people who have kept on trying when there seemed to be no hope at all. And I believe that with hope comes healing. It has been 10 years since the IOM report came out. Linda showed that in her film. Um, and unfortunately, it appears, depending on who you speak to, that there has been little or no change in those 10 years. And one could come to the conclusion that the picture of the future of patient safety is pretty dismal. It has also been 10 years since I first testified at HRQ's first summit on patient safety and medical errors about my son, Cal, who suffered brain damage from the failure to test and treat his newborn jaundice, a very normal phenomena. I also testified about my late husband, Pat, who died at 45 years of age from the failure to communicate a malignant sarcoma. His pathology got lost and his cancer went untreated. So we experienced, my family, tragic, preventable errors. We experienced cover-up. We experienced non-disclosure. We experienced the ever so famous wall of silence. We experienced missing documents. We experienced the dishonorable process of litigation and even the denial of care. We were sad, we were lonely, we were angry, and we were isolated. Nobody spoke to us, nobody told us what happened, nobody apologized. One might say we have become rivals and enemies with both the hospitals where Cal and Pat were treated in different states and the doctors. There are no warm and fuzzies, and it has been an icy, adversarial relationship, in my son's case for 14 years, and my husband's case for eight years. Yet, I am hopeful. Like Linda mentioned when I first met Linda, I was jealous of her. She recently reminded me that when I met her that I fantasized about sitting down with the hospitals and the doctors that provided care to my husband and my son and just sit down and talk. That has not happened. So now I'm on this stage to continue that story and to share the profound sense of hope that I continue to feel. I'm hopeful, not necessarily because of advances in medicine, although those are important, not because of leadership training, not because of healthcare reform, evidence-based medicine, but instead I am hopeful because of normal, common people who are willing to imagine to imagine change, and who refuse to give up hope. 
I am hopeful because that icy adversarial relationship that I described with the two hospitals might be turning a corner. The Sheridan story, part two, is here at MITS, that only Linda really has been aware of. Um, in the past four weeks, for whatever phenomena, well, I think the phenomena is called modern healthcare, um, we have had the first conversations in over a decade. I am hopeful because of organizations like MITS, like PIC, that's Parents of Infants and Children with Kernicterus. Kernicterus is the brain damage that my son and hundreds of other children have in the United States. I am hopeful because of CAPS, Consumers Advancing Patient Safety. I am hopeful because of Patty. I am hopeful because of the WHO projects who honors, respects, and values the voice of the patient. I am also hopeful because I have had the unique privilege of witnessing and being part of the creation of a brave new network of emerging heroes who are global change makers in healthcare. The part two story of the Sheridan story is that um, Linda mentioned that I recently received a unique distinction from modern healthcare in the top 25 women. It was, um, it was humorous in a, in a way because um, the CAPS office in Chicago received a letter from Modern Healthcare um, announcing my, this distinction and the office called me and they told me that I had been um, receiving this distinction, the top 25 women in healthcare, and honestly I had never heard of Modern Healthcare. So I said to Marty and Mitch, our executive director who's in the front row, I said, is this a good thing? And they said, yes, Sue, this is a good thing. And so um, from that, Modern Healthcare, um, you know, they were so nice to me. I was the only patient consumer there. And I kept saying to my mom and dad, because I invited my mom and dad, I kept saying to them, now why are they being so nice to me? And well, now I know they wanted stories. And so soon after that award, um, they did a story on mothers um, who were changing um, policy in healthcare. And so when I was interviewed, I told them the stories and I asked them if they would kindly not share the names of the hospitals where Pat and Cal had been treated. When you live in a small town like Boise, Idaho, it's not easy to be that person that names the hospital where harm occurred. We have been denied health care and it, it makes it very tough. I am not a hero back home. And so they assured me, they sent me an email assuring me that they would not use the names of the hospitals and I was relieved by that. And three days before the publishing date, um, they called me and the reporter said that she lost the battle with the editor and they would be using the names of the hospital. So um, I decided at that time that it was um, time to pick up the phone. So I called a, a board member of the hospital where my son was born in Boise, Idaho, and I crafted the following letter. It's dated October 14th, 2009. Jim, thanks so very much for initiating the possibility for me to speak to the board at your hospital. I will have to thank the many things we have in common that gave me the confidence to pick up the phone and call you. Albion College, both of our alma maters, our unique and rich experiences of raising sons with special needs, our values, and your hospital. As you know, I've experienced healthcare in a very unique way through Cal and Pat. My interactions with the healthcare and legal systems have been without a doubt the most emotionally powerful experiences I've ever had as a woman, as a wife, as a mother, and as a professional. However, my family story is also a story of awakening, of passion, and hope for the future. In an unusual way, it has been my wish for a very long time to address the board at your hospital. Despite Cal's injury, I have continued to use your hospital for my family's care. I chose your hospital for Pat's cancer treatment, the end of life care, and your hospice. I continue to believe that your hospital is a good hospital with good doctors and good people. <laughs> 